served our country both past and present. First National Bank, a Franklin family community bank, proudly sponsors Veterans of the Valley. Since 1862, First National has provided local decision making and accessibility, as well as banking products and services to Brazos Valley citizens. Welcome to Veterans of the Valley. I'm Tom Turpeville. Meet Ed Higgins of College Station. As a World War II navigator on six B-17 missions over Europe, he experienced his share of uncertain moments. Like his very first mission to Brandenburg, the gateway to Berlin, navigator of the 36th plane group. And then there were the three missions where the beaches at Roy in France was the target. Then over Dresden, finally Ingolstadt. After his tour of Europe, he became a pilot as a captain and was the ranking student officer in flight training at Bryan Air Force Base. Ed Higgins' love of flying has not stopped. At age 83, he still flies today. We welcome Lieutenant Colonel Ed Higgins to Veterans of the Valley. It's indeed a pleasure to have you, Ed, here on Veterans of the Valley. Uh, I want to move forward to get you into World War II, but talk a little bit about uh, uh, getting into the military and leading up to that. I know that you were a native of South Carolina. You went to Clemson. Your dad was in World War I. You were going to go into the Army, but your buddies talked about the Army Air Corps. So right. sort of take it from there and lead us right. on. Right, and so I did go in to the Aviation Cadet Program where I went to Gulfport Field, Mississippi, and then they sent you to College Training Detachment. I went to Sioux City, Iowa at Morningside College mm -hmm. and got jumped two classes, which is good because had I not, I might have been a cadet the whole war. There were those like, uh, I know several people that, uh, that uh, had that happen. So I got a little ahead of the curve, and of course by the year at Clemson in ROTC, that gave me a, a, a little, uh, I knew military drill and ceremonies a lot more than the typical cadet. Right. So therefore, uh, I was real glad when I got classified, bombardier, navigator, and pilot, but chosen as to be navigator because they had most of the pilots. And so I got into that uh, phase Right. You could have been a pilot right then, so you had your choice because you had qualified in all three, like you said. Yes. You went to gunnery school in Arizona. You got your gunnery wings. Yes. And then uh, uh, navigator school in Louisiana graduated from there in October of 44. So yes, correct. take us from there. That's when you got introduced to the B-17. Okay. And the fact that I'd gone through gunnery school where in the B-17 you had two guns up front. So that gave me a step up when I wanted to go to B-17s, and I did go to Tampa, Florida, MacDill Air Force Base, which is still an active base, uh, as a, in a training situation where we formed up a crew, and our commander, the first pilot was Sam Burroughs, a former football player at Auburn. Mm -hmm. He was an old guy, 24 years old, the, although our <laughs> bombardier was a former uh, uh, po policeman from Detroit, and he was 30. Right. But most of us were under 20. Right. I was 18. 18 years old. Wow. Uh, young and probably wondering what you were getting into, right? Right, but I felt in, invulnerable. I didn't realize there would be a few moments of terror. <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll talk about that because you, you were on quite an active mission to begin with, and um, you didn't know that it was as active as it really was. Uh, talk about the B-17. This, this was your plane. Obviously, it's a, it's a key uh, uh, aircraft of, of World War II, and I know you're, you're proud to be part of it. Right. Uh, they made over 12,000 of them. Wow. And uh, I know there's an exact number that the uh, Confederate Air Force has when they go out on missions, now called the Commemorative Air Force. But uh, it was um, a plane that was supposed to be able to take a lot of punishment and come back, and it did in so many cases. Of course, we never had but one occasion at Dresden where we did lose an engine, and they said, give me a heading to Switzerland, and I did 240, and uh, then we got this engine going again and began to look for other planes to join up on. Right. So uh, it was a plane that I had a lo great love for and still do. It's great in that I'm 
in the commemorative Air Force and occasionally get to fly on the Lone Star Flight Museum B-17. Right. And if we ever get the one in Houston restored, we've been working for five years to put it back. It had a lot of corrosion because of being outside. Now it's in a hangar at Hobby. I see. Of, uh, of the many World War II flyers that we've had on Veterans of the Valley, I've probably had more navigators than any other uh, uh, job. Uh, talk about the job of being a navigator for a, for a plane this size, for a bomber this size, and sort of what your duties were to keep okay. them on course, right? Right. Oh, well, uh, on a typical mission, you have a, navigators go to a certain place and pilots have their briefing, and there will be a uh, staff that have worked out the course and speeds and checkpoints and you get brief there and then you all get together as a crew and you fill in all the crew on what you're doing where you're going and what the probability if there's going to be flak or fighters mm -hmm. uh, the probability of that and of course in training you don't have that problem you just right. practice formation flying a lot right uh, six missions over Europe uh -huh. and you you chronicled them very well in the very first one, like we said in the opening. Yeah. Uh, this was your first flight, and you were the number two plane in your 36-plane group. Right. And this was a mission, uh, the Berlin mission to uh, Brandenburg, which was the gateway of Berlin. Yes. Talk about that mission. Well, uh, it was beautiful weather, and so we formed up. The way you formed up, you took off from your base at a certain interval, and you homed in on a buncher beacon, they called it. And as a navigator, I would tell my pilot, okay, home in, Sam. And you kept climbing. And if there were clouds, then you would pop out above the clouds and form up in the whole group. And it would head out. There was what they call like a lead cow, the mm -hmm. rally point airplane. And so uh, you headed out. Uh, it's a spacing. It was really beautiful to see the other planes behind our head. And once you got over France, here came the fighters racing by. There was no need for them to take off till later. And that was really high adventure, seeing them racing to the front of the, the lead planes. Right, right. Th these planes flew in, in groups, actually 1,000 plane groups. Right. Th that must have been to, to be able to look out and see something like that. I cannot imagine how awesome a sight that might be. Yeah, after we had flown about four missions, we got to be the uh, lead the Rally Point airplane, which is a high honor, we took off first, we established ourselves, and then the, we headed out and called, and the first group came behind us, and we got clear over to France, and then we turned back. And I'll never forget seeing the beauty of group after group after group all tucked in in formation. We didn't get credit for a combat mission, but that gave us the potential to be a lead crew mm -hmm. had uh, the war continued. I certainly didn't know that the Germans were going to, we thought the Germans were going to hold out at Hitler's redoubt. It turned out that that was only a, a fantasy. The war, the war was quickly over May 8th. Right. You talked about flak, and we, we've had other people on the show that talk about it, and it's a scary thing. It was one of the, it was one of the weapons, obviously, of World War II, and uh, it made rides very, very dicey and very bumpy at times. You, you, you engaged a lot of flak. In right, it, uh, both at Berlin and at uh, Dresden and at Ingolstadt. Uh, those three nights, it, uh, the three at Royan, it was low stuff. You could see them shooting, but it was way below. They didn't have the big 88s. Right. But the others, you'd see, it was just like in the movies where you'd see the poof of a, a flak, and I saw one hit a P-51 Escort, and it just disintegrated. Wow. And I saw another B-17 get hit, and it was spinning in just like the old Piper J-3 Cub. Right. And you wondered, why aren't they getting out? Well, maybe they did later, but um, it was very... In, now, I didn't know that was a rough mission. I thought, maybe it's like this every time. Right. And I, when I got back and <laughs> I was uh, debriefing, they said, boy, that was a rough one. Oh, right. okay, I didn't know any better. <laughs> right. Your second mission, which I think was three consecutive days, or your, your second, third, and fourth missions, mm -hmm. three consecutive days, the target was actually France, Roy and France. Talk about why that was and what the okay, mission was. Okay, that was the gateway to the port of Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. And the French needed to open that up so they could get supplies to uh, refurbish all the areas that had been blown up uh, during the invasion and the battle across France. So uh, the French Navy was poised with troops off the coast as soon as we had hit the three days of softening it up. They came in, made their invasion, and quickly subdued, the, I think, some 100,000 Germans. That were in the way. That were holding that port. Right. I want you to talk about, uh, you referred to this uh, earlier 
uh, one time much later on in your career at a Confederate uh, Air Force event, uh, you ran into a, a pilot, a German pilot, right? Right, a German pilot that had been at Brandenburg, and he was one of the jet pilots. And of course, they were far superior to anything we had. And uh, I think there was a, a gunner later shot one down, and he got a distinguished flying force. But it's interesting to know that the first German jet flight down, shot down was by the Tuskegee Airmen, right. who were great pilots. Right. They were almost all college graduates and right. determined to show that they could be better than anybody, as they proved they were in their unit. Exactly. But that was interesting. That they, but we didn't see any of those shot down. I saw them take off at Brandenburg and go over the top, hit a plane ahead and hit a plane behind, and they missed us. It wasn't my day to go. Right, right. But talk about this fellow <laughs> that you met. But he did say he said, that yeah. he went out. He couldn't get to his plane, so he went out into the woods, hiding behind a big tree, and here came bombs hitting. Well, one of our squadrons overshot <laughs> a bit, and some of the bombs hit out in the woods. And he wondered how we knew he was there. We didn't. And we both shook hands and laughed and said, we're glad we didn't get each other. He now is a citizen of Canada. Right, right. And you all shook hands and said, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad <laughs> yeah, that I'm here. Right. There was a lot of camaraderie among, if you were captured, you hoped that the Luftwaffe got you. They would hide you from the SS. You would swap wings and then you would go to prison camp, which was no uh, Hilton, but it beat the heck out of anything in Japan. Right. Or if the SS got you, or the worst would, of course, the civilians, and I don't blame them if you'd just blown up the family barn. Right. Uh, you would be a bit ticked off. Right, right. Well, it was a civil situation. I know I've, I've read a book uh, about the, uh, the, the prisoner of war camp in Hearn, where the, that we have down here in Hearn, where the mm -hmm. Germans were held right. there, and it, it was that type of thing. Second mission, or the third mission, excuse me, uh, at, at uh, Roy Ann, and it involved what we know now as, as napalm. Yes, mm -hmm. uh -huh. jellied gasoline, we called it. We didn't know any better, but that was what was used to pretty well to subdue Japan, the missions there, that uh, until finally they dotted the T with the uh, two A-bombs but the, we'd pretty well, they had pretty well bombed that out. Now we were, of course, after we had done our missions and came back to the States, we were supposed to fit out into B-29s and go as our group to uh, Japan in B-29s, but of course that didn't get to happen and I accepted. Right. Your fifth mission, uh, Dresden, and I know that this has a very, uh, uh, it's, it's a sad story to it, yeah. as you suspect. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, I noted, and I have a log, and I was looking at it about a week ago, a month ago, and I put it somewhere in my house, and I can't find it. Right. But anyway, I noted there were 500, I estimate, railroad cars on the railroad tracks there, and they were pointing east. We were always supposed to point out anything we saw. But in the break in the clouds, we saw those. And I thought they were loaded with German troops. I Probably they were loaded with German Jews that were being sent to the Holocaust. Right. I didn't even know there was such a thing then. And of course, uh, I would have ported it when we got back, and I don't know whether they went back and shot it up or bombed it or what. Right. I hope they didn't. Exactly. Uh, you lost an engine on that mission. Right. We had a prop runaway, and so we couldn't feather it, and that's bad because the, eventually it may break off and do a lot of damage like bring the plane down. So we finally got it reduced power. We broke out of formation. We went r ducked into clouds and uh, began to work with it. And my pilot said, give me a heading to Switzerland. So I said, two, four, zero, and then we'll fine tune it. Anyway, uh, we broke out of the clouds, and here is another plane right with us. I mean, like in formation, but neither saw each other, of course. Mm -hmm. My guardian angel was on for them on duty that day <laughs> because we broke out then, and uh, we got, started fiddling with that engine and began to get partial power. So then my pilot said, give me a heading to England. Okay, let's do 280. <laughs> right. And so we started joining up with all kind of planes that had broken, got into the weather, mm -hmm. and we ended up with 12 planes and no two from the same group. Well, as we were flying back, we saw this plane coming down from the northwest, and it didn't look like it was one of ours or anybody, so we knew the Germans had some fake airplanes, that is, they had captured planes, and they would drive up into the formation and shoot, shoot, shoot some down. Mm -hmm. So we put a burst out across the uh, plane, and it broke it broke off and went back toward German, the northern Germany. So it probably was one of those, uh, there was a squadron they had of replica airplanes that had been rebuilt 
Right. And your sixth mission, Ingolstadt, what was that? Ingolstadt was supposed to be at Munich because there were th uh, German jets parked on the Autobahn. The Germans were thinking ahead when they built those uh, Autobahns and had areas where you could literally have airfields. And there were 300 German jets there. Well, when we got over there, they reported that they uh, were out of fuel, that, that no need to bomb them. So we then picked up a target of uh, opportunity. Our second was uh, Ingolstadt, mm -hmm. which was a, a town and it had a bridge over the Rhine. So why not knock it out? Right. So we all dumped on poor old Ingolstadt. Indeed, indeed. Uh, we have some photographs and some uh, very uh, uh, compelling photographs that. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Higgins uh, has brought, and some of these photographs were taken from his plane uh, on one of some of these bombing missions. Uh, this is uh, out of a, a sort of a, a yearbook uh, that you have of your group, and this is the front inside cover that we got a scan of, and you're actually flying in that airplane, right? Yeah, that is that first mission mm -hmm. to Berlin with Bob Glazen of Beaumont, the head, uh, the second, the backup pilot, the deputy lead. And of course, had that lead ship up there, which probably had Major Carmack, who was a great West Pointer and a great leader. Unfortunately, he later was killed in the plane crash later on in his career, which was a pity to made general. Right. Great right. leader. So uh, I was up there and navigating away, following. There you go. Let's move on to the uh, next one. Here's and, your group. And that is my crew picture. Uh, Sam Burrs on the left, and, and George Nickel the bombardier, and Owen Paul who is still alive out in uh, um, Seattle, Washington, and there I am on the right, the lower level, and then the other bazooka on the left was the uh, best deputy pilot, Noy Eisenhower, and then on the right, the right is the ball turret gunner. They were always free spirits. You right. really had to bail them out, but you'd pro them, bust them in private, and then pr promote them back to sergeant. Chandler, and he's still alive in New Orleans. It's amazing. You, you might forget who you met yesterday, but you'll never forget these names, no. will you? <laughs> Let's move on to uh, another one. Talk about that. That's a, that's that a good was, looking young man. That was the day I went to, uh, into the Air Force as an aviation student to report to Gulfport Field, Mississippi, and mm -hmm. that was my famous dog spot, a, a bird dog champion. I love to quail hunt, and my bike, I love to ride my bike over to play uh, baseball. And I was heading off for the adventure. So you had to say goodbye to not only your family, but yeah. to Spot, too, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that must have been tough. Yeah, it was, of course, I was <laughs> still not very sad. I was looking right. forward to the, what it was next. It's a fine-looking bicycle there. Yeah, a, a <laughs> sterling, made sterling bicycle, built like a watch. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Okay, th this is just, uh, this is uh, Roy Ann, uh -huh. the, the first day of the bombing. Uh -huh. And you see the target there is the beach, and if you look right in the middle of the picture, you see the cluster of bombs that have just left your airplane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just a fascinating, right. fascinating, fascinating photograph. And then we've got a sequence here. Let's go on to the next one. Here the bombs are closer to the target. Yeah. They're a little uh -huh. bit more spread out as they're heading down. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the city of Roy Ann that we see there that's on the beach. Uh -huh. Right. And then move on to the third one, and the bombs have dropped. And you can see sort of in the, uh, yeah. the, the, the right center of the photograph uh, where the bombs have dropped and the smoke is rising. Yeah, that's more inland where the Germans right. had retreated and to their bunkers or revetments or whatever, but they didn't have their heavy guns anymore. And these are photographs that were taken out of your airplane at the right. time that it uh -huh. happened. All right, let's move on. What's this group? Okay, that's when I was at Bryan. Uh, no, Spencefield, Georgia, in primary pilot screening. Uh -huh. The board, of the, the man to the left is Joe Barker, class of, of 50 A&M, and that's Mr. Shub. I'm in the uh, civilian, I'm in the Air Force uniform. We have, right. I was Second aerodrome the left, officer right. for right. that day. We took turns doing it. I'm a captain, and there's Mr. Shub, a great instructor pilot, and that's a French student right there, Balain, and a, Je a Belgium. Balafan on the right. We had foreign students in there. We had one that later, the chassis his father made commander of the French Air Force. Right. But he, and he was in another unit. What's that plane? Is that and an that's Avenger? And that's the T-6 Texan. Oh, okay. And I later came across that exact airplane owned by somebody. I knew the tail number and uh, somebody at a uh, air show at, uh, I believe, at uh, Brownsville. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
my exact airplane. All right, let's move on to the, uh, I think we've got uh, one more. That's uh, one of your planes. Yeah, that was a plane that most everybody had one with that rather interesting right. name. Aptly and named. And it yes. had uh, steel plates on the side and underneath. And I, I got to fly a couple of those missions uh, that I flew were in that airplane. Right, and so people can see where the navigator was. It's, right. The bombardier is in the nose, and then you're right behind and the bombardier. And you can see that little package right behind the nose is one of my guns. Right, with the three small windows. And there was one on the other windows. side, and those two windows is where I looked out, and I had a, a turret where I could shoot the stars or uh, get uh, right. headings. Right, you operated a gun on each side. Right. Right, right. All right. Who's, 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 okay. that, who's, that, who's that guy with Ed Higgins? Right, that's <laughs> Bob, Bob Hope, who was a great friend of the military, and he came here, I believe, in 84 to uh, speak at, uh, and I know Jackie Sherrill made him an honorary Aggie, but I was uh, in my s s Confederate Air Force uniform, and we made him an honorary colonel in the Aggie wing, and he said, I'll p play golf down at Palm Springs and wear that cap. So no, I bet uh, he did. He came here to speak, and I always greatly admired what he did. Right, right. He's looking right at you. And this is a poster that you have that we took a picture of, a final view of the B-17. That's, right. that's a beautiful poster. And you flew in this plane. Yeah, I flew a practice mission in that mission, that airplane after the war when we were training to go uh, sharpen up our navigation and then go convert to be 29s and it was called a bit of lace it was named for one of the steve canyon uh airplane uh one of his things he had right so i still have it was the nose art and you see it had a lot of missions on it those are great pictures i know like most uh, who fought in uh, europe uh, after you the war in europe was over you like everybody else was planning to go west to go to japan but then yes. the bomb changed all that uh, you went to Northwestern State, got a math, math degree, you went to grad school at Colorado, and then you were recalled to active duty after, right. after uh, serving in the reserves. Sort of take us from there and tell okay. us what you did. When I was recalled to active duty, I went to uh, um, Santa Ana, California, and uh, got upgraded as nav radar bomb instructor. Mm -hmm. Then I came to Ellington, and where at Ellington I was a flight commander and would take students all the way through the navigation training and bombed it. I uh, had a class that had such pretty girls and I recommended one guy for instructor and when he came back for his vacation he introduced me and that was my first wife who I lost to cancer later but uh, Virginia Wills. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wills was her father who was a doctor at Baylor Med School and had been a commander in the Navy in World War II right. and a great gentleman. Anyway, we, uh, she went with me on my career and her uh, uncle was commander of the Louisiana Air National Guard, had flown the hump. And she said, and I got a chance to go to pilot school, and she said, great, you ought to go. So the next day I walked my thing through FlyTaf headquarters, and away I went right. to Moultrie and then to Bryan Air Force Base. Yeah, you found out at age 30 that you could still right be a pilot. I, I, could, I, I was delighted. I love <laughs> flying. I had gotten my private pilot license when I was over at Northwestern, so I could fly Piper J3 Cubs. But this was nice to be able to fly jet uh, trainers here at Bryan. Right, and you were a captain by then. And so I was you a captain, were the, yeah, you so were that beat being a cadet. Officer. But I, w I was glad to help straighten up after we did our flying every day. Right. Uh, eventually went to San Antonio for training in the spy plane. The uh, right, I was going to go there. You were going to do that. It never I, came out. I went to after I graduated. I went to uh, back to Ellington where we were going to get some multi time and then go to the U2 program. But then they found I didn't have a, enough time. Right. So instead, I ended up going overseas to Newfoundland, flying in the Arctic, which was great in that. I flew with some great instrument pilots and learned how to fly very good instruments. And uh, when I came back, I came back to uh, Ardmore, Oklahoma, and came down to visit at A&M. And um, uh, Dr. Fred Smith and his wife Odette were friends of Colonel Dittman. And I interested. I said I was, would like to be an instructor. So she picked up the phone, called Colonel Dittman. He, I went over to visit with him. He picked up the phone and called Flytaff headquarters and said, uh, I want this man. Mm -hmm. so, that, so then I was at A&M instructing, and after four years, I got a chance. General Schreiber said, get another degree, and I'll put you in the space program. Right. So at 36, I got my Texas Aggie degree. I was delighted to become officially an Aggie. Exactly. And because <laughs> I admired them so much, and then to be one. 
and of course I uh, ended up back in the uh, space program for my final career, but then went to Northrop after I retired at NASA right. for 15 years, and all the exciting and some uh, catastrophe areas. Right, right. Production and procurement, that's what you were in with NASA. I was NASA. in production Talk about. and procurement as a right. senior engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did that involve at, at well, NASA, just briefly? Well, it involves putting together a uh, pro proposal, usually. I would track what we were doing. Every month I got a print out from our computer section as to how we were doing on our pricing and uh, if we needed to hire or fire. And uh, Northrop was a wonderful company. And when my late wife was with, uh, inflicted with breast cancer, um, they said, just come in when you can, but I had a good staff. And so that was wonderful, the way they took care of her. Right. And incidentally, that after I lost her, one of the ladies who was taking care of her after about a year and a half said, I think you ought to meet somebody. And I said, well, I'm not looking. And that was my little Paige, mm -hmm. who was a teacher at St. John's and a wonderful lady. And when I met her and some of her students said, you were just a wonderful teacher. I said, I like what I'm hearing. That's right. And now we're 31 years down the road. Indeed. You married her in 19, uh, 1977. You came back to work at, uh, at A&M, where you still right. work today in the uh, Department of Animal Science. Just talk briefly about what you do, because you work every morning. Right. Um, we have projects through the, it was through the Texas A&M Experiment Station, uh, but it's in the Animal Service Science Building, where we take whatever product is put before us, we might sniff it, we might see how it looks, or more, usually we taste it. Mm -hmm. And we are in isolation booths, which are uh, rated. Right. And it's a fun, interesting job. Many are PhD or master programs, and uh, I've seen people go on to uh, great, great promotions and great jobs down thing. After all, everybody loves to eat and needs to eat. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and so the, 30, the 30 minutes goes so quickly and we are out of time, but what a wonderful, wonderful career. And we thank you for being here and thank you for your service. Thanks for having me. All right. Ed Higgins' career took him from the European theater of World War II to NASA and the space program and eventually as a civilian to Texas A&M, where he still works as a program assistant in the Animal Science Department. He and Paige have been married 31 years, and he'll proudly speak of his children, his grandchildren, and his three great-grandchildren. We salute the service of Ed Higgins of College Station, as we do all veterans. I'm Tom Turpeville. Join us next time on Veterans of the Valley. In honor of the veterans who have served our country, both past and present, First National Bank of Franklin.